early automotive history in the United States is a fascinating thing to dig into. Hundreds upon hundreds of companies were producing cars, mostly in a boutique fashion, and they all had a different idea of how they should look, how they should drive, how they should be powered, steered, etc. Because of this, it becomes really, really hard to discern certain firsts in the history of American cars. Heck, that's even true of the topic of this video. But I'm here today to make a case that the first V8 production car sold in America was built in the 1905-06 to time frame in a little Massachusetts town by a guy who also managed to offer the first race car someone could order turnkey from an actual car company and who also sold the first eight-cylinder car in the United States, and you've likely never heard of him before. Now, I'm not claiming this to be the first mass-produced V8 car. The Cadillac of 1914 seems to have that distinction, but this car was a first that a customer could order with a V8-style engine and jounce their way down the largely terrible roads of the day. Of course, our story doesn't start in 1905. It starts in 1883, about as far away from Massachusetts as one could get in the United States, which was San Francisco. It just so happened that on March 5th of 1905, the U.S. Patent Office had its busiest day in history to that point, approving 455 patents. Now, one of them was for an automatic governor and cutoff for steam engines submitted by a man named Herbert Howard Buffum. It would be the first patent in an engineering and design career that would lead to many, many more over the course of the next 34 years. Sometime between 1883 and 1887, Buffum relocated to New England, which was the industrial hub of the country at that point, and he found work in various engineering positions. The next patent to carry Buffum's name was granted in 1887 for an automatic car axle lubricator. Now, Buffum was calling Manchester, New Hampshire's home at this point, but his next move, both physically and in his career, would set the path to wealth and eventually headlong into building cars. Buffum relocated about 100 miles to the south, in the south shore of Massachusetts. Now this is a seemingly odd move until you consider his strengths and what the area was at the time. Starting in the 1860s, southeastern Massachusetts became the shoe manufacturing hub of the nation. In one five to 10 mile radius, the majority of the shoes on the feet of Union soldiers were made, and eventually a disproportionate volume of the shoes that the people around the country were wearing all came from this area as well. In 1889, he truly launched his star and fortune by going headlong into the shoe industry, inventing and patenting a string of sewing machines, nailing machines, and other industrial advancements to further automate the process of manufacturing shoes. He officially went into business selling his own machinery by opening the H.H. H. Buffum Company in Abington, Massachusetts, circa 1890. He chose a small town which not only had its own multiple shoe factories, but one that was adjacent to Brockton, Massachusetts, then known as Shoe City, USA. Roughly 15,000 people per day were working in shoe factories in Brockton alone, and the city was so into shoes, their minor league baseball team was even the shoemakers. Buffum began by converting a former textile building into a machine shop, and that brought in the money, the contracts, the labor, and a very successful and busy business. Now this building still stands, and as you look at it today, this was the final form that Buffum had it in after expanding it a few times when he got into auto manufacturing. And instead of machinery and cars, today they manufacture pizzas. In 1894, Buffum had been quietly designing an engine, running gear, and other mechanical systems for a car he wanted to make. It would be called the Buffum Stanhope, and in 1895 he took to the streets of Abington and the surrounding areas on it. Buffum teamed up with a local carriage maker named William Pierce, whose shop was located a short stroll from his own, to come up with a workable chassis and suitable body for the creation. Now, the car is called a Stanhope because that's the style of carriage body Pierce crafted and placed upon the tubular iron frame he had made for the car. The tall, elevated seating position allowed for Buffum to fit his self-designed four-cylinder engine under said seat, making this the first four-cylinder car in history, and ipso facto, the first ever produced in the United States. Incredibly, the car still exists and has been sold at auction a few times since it was found intact in the 1930s. Now, this thing, as rudimentary as it looked, was wildly advanced for the era. The 20 horsepower rating of the engine, the fact that it had a rudimentary dual exhaust system employing two mufflers, an engine that could be started with an electric starter, and even a two-speed planetary transmission were all included in this car. Like so many things in early automotive history, though, there is a catch. Other people have dug into the history about this car, and things get muddy on when it was actually built. 
Now, there is some concern about the roots of the 1895 build claim in light of other information that suggests the car was built sometime around 1900. Now, even if it were made in 1900, it is still an advanced automobile for the time, and it's one that Buffum was somewhat obsessed with keeping a secret. At this time in history, the more your car was seen out and about, the more chance some other local builder of automobiles or aspiring local builder of automobiles could capture your secrets. One of the reasons this machine has survived in such wonderful condition is the fact that Buffum barely ever drove the car around. Instead, he would use it as a springboard for the larger version he had for his car company. If you're wondering why a guy who clearly knew the patent game didn't seem to file any patents on this car, I believe it goes back to protecting his secret technologies. Once you file patents for things, they become kind of public knowledge. And once that knowledge gets out, people can put their own spin on it and take it from you. One last point on the Stanhope. I know there is some stuff out there which brings a lot of evidence against its production in 1895, but when we look at the next cars Buffum made, they look like proper cars. And that's a quantum leap ahead of the motorized carriage that carried his name first. So to think this thing was built in 1900 versus 1895... I'm siding with 1895. Now we jump back up to the 1901-1902 time frame, and Buffum comes out with a very unique flat four engine. Now not a ton is known of the details of this engine, but it was rated at 20 horsepower. It allowed his cars to have a distinctively flat nose and used an innovative design that even included a shared connecting rod that employed roller bearings on the crank. Buffum cars were built to a very high standard and well sold in small numbers, they were as good or better than anything available on the market at the time. It's going to be noted, though, the company produced a grand total of just 70 cars in more than a decade of business. These cars in 1901 and 02, as well as the ensuing Model H, carried a list price of $2,500. This would have been a total extravagance for the normal working person, but if you worked in upper management for a company or were a doctor, an engineer, something of that level... The car would be about half your yearly salary if we go back and look at the data of the time. In 1903, Buffum was advertising his cars in local newspapers, including the regionally massive Boston Globe, but no further than that. And still at this time, if you wanted a Buffum car, you had to travel to the factory and sit down and order the thing in person. Now when you did that at Buffum, you'd likely spend some time with a young, energetic company treasurer, the always impeccably dressed and active member of the local high society, William E. Bates. His name will come back in a minute. Also during 1903, Buffum was awarded a patent for the first version of the tilt steering wheel. Sure, it was rudimentary and cantankerous, but this is a tilt wheel. There's no denying it. 1904 was an insanely manic year for the Buffum Car Company. While continuing to grow and maintain his shoe manufacturing equipment business, Buffum really threw in on the car manufacturing this year. At the top of the line, he was producing the high-dollar Model H, which sold for $4,000. That is more than $140,000 in today's money. This baby had a self-starting, large displacement, 35-horsepower inline four-cylinder engine, along with a good-looking handmade aluminum body. Now, he was also selling the much more reasonable Model E, which had a base price of $1,200, and then it was $1,350 with such luxuries as a windshield. It used the flat-four engine that the earlier models did, making 20 horsepower. Now, Buffum showed both of these models at the Boston Auto Show in the late winter of 1904, but the big story here was not a production car, it was a racer. The Buffum Model G Greyhound Racer had a 100 horsepower, horizontally opposed 8-cylinder engine, making it the first 8-cylinder car ever sold in America. It was also the very first race car any manufacturer had made and offered for sale, however many people wanted to buy, to the public. The car was a beast, 2,300 pounds, a 10-foot wheelbase, coil springs on the corners, and a one-speed or perhaps high-gear-only driveline. And there was only six inches of ground clearance. This baby was a real hot rod. Now, the car was designed in the vein of the Winton Bullet, and it was intended to compete with that car and other high-level racers of the day. The Central Automobile Company of New York bought the first and only one ever made. Named the Central Greyhound, it was delivered to them in New York, where it promptly suffered major carburation problems, never ran right, and if it ever actually did end up racing, it never won, as there's no record of the car competing at any high-level competition of the era. Well a flop, having the designation as the first eight-cylinder car and the first catalog race car in the U.S. is still pretty awesome. So 1904 has had a couple of highs, mostly, 
but there was a very big low in 1904, and it goes back to William E. Bates. Bates was the charismatic and well-heeled H.H. Buffum Company treasurer, and in fact, he was a little too well-heeled. William Bates had been apparently embezzling money hand over fist for some time right under the nose of H.H. Buffum, and actually maybe that was the problem. The story made for breathless headline news in the April and May editions of the Boston Globe and other local newspapers. The initial number for the theft was thought to be $5,000, and then as the investigation deepened, Buffum himself said it could be upwards of $10,000. Beyond all that, Bates vanished without a trace. His high society wife was apparently completely unawares of his activity because she got ditched as well. An arrest warrant was issued, but there is no record of an arrest or trial of William E. Bates. But there was a silver lining here. Buffum was making so much money, it didn't seem to slow him down at all. The affair was embarrassing, but his shoemaking equipment continued fresh patents and huge backlog of business kept the cash rolling in. The one thing it did do was give the impression he really hadn't been paying close enough attention to his company, but other than the embarrassment and sting of that, he moved on. And they landed in 1905 on Buffum's true footnote in the history of American horsepower, the first V8 production car. By using the basic design of his four-cylinder inline engine and joining them to a common crankshaft, H.H. H. Buffum created a 6.6-liter V8 that was rated by some accounts at 40 horsepower and by others up to 50. Unfortunately, there is basically one existent image of the engine in a car, and this is it, stuffed in the front of a runabout-style machine, making it 100% the first factory sleeper ever made, intentionally or not. Selling the models E, F, H, and K in a variety of body styles, Buffum was trying to cover all aspects of the market. From the cheap runabouts to the large luxury end of the buying public, he really did offer something for everybody, and if you wanted it, you just had to come to the factory and buy it. Buffum cars were well regarded and respected. The earlier models can be found for sale in newspaper classifieds of the day, and while the company had a minuscule yearly output, the stuff they made was handmade and of very high quality, and it was as good as anything you could buy across the country. The final full year of production for Buffum was 1906. Unfortunately, there are no records to indicate how many cars were made before the Enterprise was closed in 1907, about a year before Henry Ford would run his Model T through the industry like a scythe, plowing under hundreds of small car companies like Buffum. Buffum capitulated before the tidal wave would have washed him away. Unlike so many that left the industry broken in crushing debt, Buffum was not only able to walk away, but gracefully slide away. He moved back to New Hampshire, continued to invent things, made boats, and generally lived a comfortable life by all indication. In fact, long after he was done making cars, he was earning patents for stuff like a carburetor, an interesting leaf spring suspension setup. Check this out. And then there's this thing, a unique drive mechanism to a car that is seemingly a kind of primordial CVT. And then amazingly, in 1917, Buffum struck gold again with a patent for an improved version of a commercial sprinkler head, which was adopted by many at the time and licensed to several companies for production. H.H. H. Buffum died in 1933 at the age of 68 years old. He had moved back to the western part of the country, passing away in Oregon. He left a pretty sizable estate to his immediate family and his wife, who in 1934 sold that original 1895, maybe, Stanhope, which continues to exist today. It is one of the few, if not the only true relic of Buffum's existence. The early U.S. auto industry is fascinating. A man who made industrial sewing machines, shoe nailing machines, and medieval equipment to blast the eyelets through leather was also an automotive innovator lost to history. If you had the brains, some money, a machine shop, and a dream in the early 1900s, you could be an automobile manufacturer. History has long forgotten H.H. H. Buffum, but today you know his name. You know his legacy. And most importantly, you know his cars were pretty awesome, especially the V8-powered ones. His original factory still stands today, and thousands of people pass by every day having no idea what piece of automotive history was born inside those brick walls. How cool is that? I'm Brian Loans. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more Gearhead history, racing, and mechanical content.